You know, a lot of people talk about racial prejudice, and some people have gone so far as to say that there are actually two Americas, one black and one white. But talk is cheap, so I decided to look into the problem myself, first hand to go underground and actually experience America as a white man. The introduction that I've had to read aloud to avoid copyright infringement is an SNL skit from the 80s starring Eddie Murphy, best known of course by his career-defining role as the voice of Donkey in Shrek, among a handful of other minor movies and TV shows. In the video, Murphy dons white makeup in order to pass as white and determine the extent of white privileges in society. He soon finds out how strong the racial divide remains, experiencing a far more favorable life in whiteface. This very notion of racial divide is a fundamental truth that has pervaded through time and still remains relevant in the modern day as exemplified through the Black Lives Matters protests, which have attacked ongoing systemic racial prejudices. Before the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which enforced action against forms of discrimination, the act of passing white was a tool to escape racist remarks, evade segregation laws, and to gain access into a world of whiteness that had been exclusionary. Race is often considered a social construct. The Afro-American is merely a lamp-blacked Anglo-Saxon, wrote George Schuyler in 1926. People of colour have been perpetually restricted in their social movements, instructed by an oppressive colonial force which aims to subjugate so-called inferior races. They are misinformed and misled into believing that being white is an advantage in all aspects. Whiteness is a symbol of all virtues, as Langston Hughes states. Being white, that is being ethnically Caucasian or Nordic, was made a paradigm for people of colour, a trait to look up to. The act of racial parsing itself was not an option for all non-whites by virtue of their features. Some specialist products were invented to tap into this market, such as the kink no more hair straightening balm, providing a solution for quote, chromatic perfection, whiteness thus being viewed as desirable and perfect. How easy would it be if whiteness, primarily the privileges inherent to the race, could be attainable for any and all that wanted it? And what would the wide-reaching ramifications be of a procedure that could bring about permanent universal whiteness? Schuyler considers these such questions in his satire Black No More, a speculative piece on the creation of a machine that can turn black people white. It proposes a scientific solution to solve the, quote, Negro problem. The Negro Problem, a term attributed to a collection of essays by prominent black writers at the turn of the 20th century, is concerned with the social status of Afro-Americans in the wake of emancipation, but in an era of Jim Crow segregation. White American society was still hostile to other races, making integration into the society all that more challenging. The scientific solution of black men war induces the effects of vitiligo in patients in order to whiten darker skin tones effectively and permanently. The creator of the machine, Dr. Crookman, recognises that removing the racial determiner of skin tone ought to allow for a greater integration and tolerance of the black Americans that have been restricted by prejudices. Nothing socially constructive ultimately materialises from the solution besides the debasement of the conjecture that whiteness equates to freedom. As reminded in the extended title of the novel, America has long since prided itself on being the land of the free. In order to enjoy this liberty to its fullest extent, however, particularly in the early 20th century, there is a preconceived understanding that one must be white. The very notion of desiring, acquiring and revelling in freedom is a motif of the novel. In such manner, Max turned Matthew, the protagonist of the novel, upon receiving his treatment, feels himself truly free and thus a true American citizen. However, mere days later, Matthew becomes cognizant of the indoctrinated deceptions of white supremacy that had formed a fiction of the greatness of being white from his youth. It is not the rosy existence that he had anticipated. Instead, he finds this new culture rather dull and boring. There is such negligible difference between the races, in fact, that Matthew considers whether the conversion was even worth it at all. He thus feels deeply conflicted, on the one hand exulting in the opportunity to escape discrimination and restrictive prejudices, but this, at the same time feeling remorse, pangs of mingled disgust, disillusionment and nostalgia over a new exclusion from his past culture, which in retrospect he appears to admire more. Ultimately, the painful memories of past discriminations overall his regret. He concludes that he must leave Harlem, which is deemed synonymous with black culture, class and society, and that there was no other alternative for him than to seek his future among the Caucasians 
with whom he now rightfully belonged. As the exodus of the black race continues, the satire turns deeply political. Black No More becomes an economically driven institution in which people of colour are reduced to a mere commodity, exploited out of the false perpetuated notion of white supremacy. The managing staff of the institution view it as a triumphant success, perceiving that they had cleaned up the problem, as if blackness needed to be sanitised. News tabloids and public organisations begin to antagonise the Black No More institution for their own gain, appealing to the white-born population that had been ingrained with systemic colour prejudices. Political activism and violence ensue the agitation. The unexpected births of mixed-race babies from parents that had secretly integrated into the white society causes tumultuous rioting and tragic arson. This headline from the recruitment advertisement for the Knights of Nordica, a fictional revival of the Ku Klux Klan, appeals further to the white masses. This religious organisation emerges to social political dominance in the novel, exploiting the unfounded concern of social ruination by a new race of whites. Matthew joins and scales the ranks of this organisation, recognising the ease to which the manipulation of the emotions of white supremacists could lead to monetary gain. The adamant calls by racial purists to secure the colour line that they had worked so hard to establish but was rapidly fading were met by the solution of personal genealogy. The way that true genetic whiteness could be distinguished was ultimately to trace back family history. The dedication open in the novel satirises this concept of racial integrity and purity by asserting a genealogical requirement that it is almost entirely impossible for anyone to be possessing. This is in response to the Racial Integrity Act of 1924, which brought a prohibition of miscegenation, that is intermarriage, and the enactment of a one-drop rule. The latter motion determined that anyone with a remote black ancestral member was to be categorised as non-white. County Collins's poem Heritage, which is used as the epigraph to Nella Larson's Passing, a novel based on black Americans attempting to appear white, speaks greatly to this injustice of representation. One three centuries removed from the scenes his fathers loved. Spicy grove, cinnamon tree, what is Africa to me? As for the case of missing or incomplete genealogical charts, the purists in Black No More assume that these such people must be non-whites by some degree. This is an assumption founded upon the lack of care given to maintaining slave records, expressed in Booker T. Washington's autobiography. In the days of slavery, not very much attention was given to family history and family records that is, black family records. Ultimately, the genealogical charting undertook in the novel in order to distinguish non-whites from whites yields displeasing results for the racial purists. The democratic politicians that advocated for white integrity and supremacy become exposed for having distant black heritage and thus harmed and disgraced by their own political agenda. The final satirical twist revealed in the plot is that genealogical testing is not the only method to discern a, quote, real Caucasian from an imitation one. The root of this discovery actually returns back to the nature of the skin condition fertiligo. Black No More's process lightens the complexion of the patient considerably, more so than an average white skin tone. Just as John Bellew curiously dwells on the unusual lily-white countenance of Claire in the early stage of their matrimony, the imitation Caucasians of Black No More are revealed through their abnormal, lily-white skin. They would begin to receive questioning glances for their exceedingly pale tone, and, in a triumphant return to racial prejudice as eagerly craved by the white supremacists, the paler-skinned individuals would receive discriminatory remarks. Claims become fabricated as to the mental inferiority and social ineptitude of paler-skinned people, reconstituting the colour line that had been the source of misery and restriction of liberty for Afro-Americans before the Black No More process. By the end of the novel, being darker becomes a virtue. The racial hierarchy completely switches, but it still remains in favour of the genetic whites, proving ultimately that race is socially constructed and it allows for prejudices. Unfortunately, the new veneration of blackness comes after all Afro-Americans had left their race behind, all except, quote, a couple thousand diehards and those in institutions. Just as there had been products such as Kink No More to help those pass white in society, new inventions gained popularity for darkening complexions. Everybody that was anybody now had a stained skin. 
Whilst there is so much more to say about this sociopolitically loaded novel, as well as the author Schuyler who proved to become a controversial figure in the mid-20th century, I will end the presentation with a recitation of Eddie Murphy's closing address. After his own experience passing white in society, he declares that until the true race problem is solved, people of colour will continue to mould themselves in an attempt to attain the privileges of the white world. So, what did I learn from all of this? Well, I learnt that we still have a very long way to go in this country before all men are truly equal. But I'll tell you something. I got a lot of friends. We got a lot of makeup. So the next time you're hugging up with some really super groovy white guy, or even a really great super keen white chick, don't be too sure. They might be black. <laughs>